Beloved, God uses our testimonies to impact others. Let me know that. He does that. Amen. Good word, Bill. God gives us those words. God gives us a word. How many know that God wants you to have a word? He does. He doesn't want you just to have one word for all your life. He wants to give you revelation. Well, I don't really need this bio because I know this guy way too well. But Rex and I have been friends for quite a while, and he has pastored over in uh, Charlotte at United Faith and First Assembly over there for seven, eight years time frame. And we have grown to be good friends almost instantaneously the first time. He's been in ministry over 40 years. And God has used him in an impressive way. He was, how many remember the uh, church people back in the early days in the 60s and 70s? You have to be around for that time. Yeah, Jesus people, yeah, that's right. The Jesus people. And uh, God used him to change a life of a man who was living in total darkness on a conversation on a Tuesday and he was sharing it with me and he says Bob my life before that was nothing but a lie and tragic and disappointing even though I was so successful in some things and he says God has transformed me to be such a Jesus lover that that's all I long for and God has used him to revitalize churches plant churches put churches back in order when they were totally out of order, restore trust when they were trust was broken in communities. God has used him mightily. Maybe that's part of the reason we both have such an affection toward one another and we have, I think the world and he and Chris have just been faithful in the call. And today he, I asked him if he would share, not just this morning, but I want him to share tonight. And he and I are just excited about what God's going to do It's an amazing thing what God is doing. He will open our eyes. God wants to open our eyes to see the miraculous. It's happening. And if we're not careful, we'll miss it. We will miss it if we watch with natural eyes. But those things that are eternal are invisible. But God is here. Would you welcome my friend, Rex Bornman? (laughs) I love you. No, I love you more. No, love no, no, no. See, I, that's one of the, the things that I love about Pastor Bob. Uh, every time you tell him, I love you, he just shoots right back. I love you more. And, and I always, I just miss it each time because I want to start out by saying, I love you more and see where he goes from there. How many of you really know that, uh, you know, it's kind of a one-step program to serve the Lord? It is, you know, uh, you, you got to live in love. Amen. This is this is the commandment. This is the great, this is the big enchilada. Amen. This is the whole cannoli for those, none of you have Italian roots apparently. Uh, <laughs> but this is it, you know, if you can, if you can live in the love of Christ and, and honestly over the years that I have known uh, your pastor and now Kathy, I just am so... Uh, affirmed. I would say impressed because it's impressive, but it's also incredibly affirming to see people who who just live and really live in the love of Jesus Christ the Lord. Would you give your pastors a hand? They're wonderful people. Yeah. Woo! Can I get a whoop whoop? (laughs) Uh, I love this place. I do. I love this place by proxy because I have loved your pastor for such a long time, and I hear all these amazing and wonderful stories about uh, the people at Albemarle First Assembly, and, uh, and I have just honestly been wanting to come here for the longest time, and it's finally worked out. And then pastor was so gracious to say I could just come and sort of uh, abuse you for the whole day. Well, I don't plan it to be abuse, but I do plan for it to be a day's worth of uh, uh, what I think is exciting in terms of the presence and the power of the Lord. How many of you know a day doesn't seem like a lot in most of your schedules, but when you start to put it in the hand of the Lord, a day can be a pretty cool thing. I just remind you, this is the God who, who didn't draw up a plan. 
He didn't consult an architect. He didn't amass a whole bunch of resource. When he created the worlds, he just... You've read it. He just spoke. He just said something. Let this be. Boom. And there it was. And I don't know if you've ever had the chance to explore it, but uh, somebody was talking about the planets and the stars and the whole shooting match that goes on there. Uh, There's another world underneath the sea. Really, if you've ever had a chance to snorkel or scuba dive, you'll understand what I mean. But it's amazing to me because I've done it. The only thing wrong with snorkeling or scuba diving is that you want to talk, but you have a big rubber thing in your mouth because you're wanting to say, that's magnificent. That's amazing. That is just beautiful beyond measure. And honestly, for the most of us, it's hidden. You look at the top and you see the sun shining off the water and you go, "Ah, underneath. It is gorgeous. It's magnificent beyond measure. And this is just, this is how he is. This is who God is. The works of the Lord are amazing and marvelous beyond measure. And he doesn't have to sweat to make it happen. He speaks. I said all that to tell you that Uh, I really believe this God is our God. I think we've perverted the truths over the years. I think we've fallen away from some of the things or maybe never really stretched forward to receive some of the fullnesses. But I don't think he's changed. And I think he has promised that wherever two or three kind of come together with the intent to experience God, that he will show up. Amen. And, and can, I, can I put it in a, in a, he will show up and he will show, some of you are going to say off, but, but you know, show forth. Is that okay? He will. He, he's willing to show up and show himself in the most powerful and profound ways if you know why. He's intending to do that. So today, I just want to do what I think the Lord has called me to do. And, and uh, I am a missionary. I'm sure I do it poorly. I don't have cutesy stories and all these nifty pictures to tell you and blah, blah, blah. If God doesn't provide for us, we sink like a stone. But if he provides, blessing happens. So I'm just trusting that. But today is a sacred day. And this is a sacred trust that I really honor. And I ask the Lord to... Uh, if he would help me today to speak something into your life that is, that is more than just a message, more than just a, a sermoning kind of thing, but a word yes. from him, yes. this living word from him. And he gave me three words to share with you. So now you think it's going to take forever, but I have the morning and the evening both. <laughs> So I, I want to share just honestly three words with you uh, with, uh, within the time frames that we have. And, and th- those are these words. So mark them down. Two of them we'll deal with this morning, one tonight. But the first is the word privilege. Everybody say it with me. Privilege. One more time. Privilege. privilege. Well, look, at, aren't those tech people awesome? Yes. Yes. Yeah, even though one screen is not working, there's the word. <laughs> privilege. The second word is purpose. And there it is again. The third word is power. And I want to talk to you about that one this evening. Because I really believe that God intends. No, in fact, that God spoke into being and prophesied, if you will. It's hard to say that God prophesied since he knows the end from the beginning and from ancient times the stuff that's not yet come to pass. He's already seen the whole shooting match. He already knows what's going to happen. But he said in the last days that there would be profound and powerful demonstrations of who God is. That would not just be in the body of Christ, in the people of God, but that would be in the earth. That would be in the, in the heavens. That would be signs and wonders. I believe that this God is still our God. Amen. 
I believe that he has not changed. I believe, though, that largely even the church that calls itself Pentecostal has forsaken or, or somehow drifted away from their demand for this miraculous God, this supernatural God to show forth his power and his blessing. And I think once we rediscover our purpose and our privilege, then we'll understand why the power of God is given to us. It's not given to you just to make you feel good. It's not given to you to prostitute it out there and sell it for money. Make a ministry out of it. Make a mint. Write a book. It is given for a purpose. And we'll talk about that purpose this morning. But I first want to talk to you about privilege, if that's okay with you. I am uh, absolutely everything that Pastor said I am. I was a, uh, a lost young man back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, I, it was in the 60s. I was a teenager of the 60s. How many of you are even old enough to remember the 60s? Yeah, well, if you remember them, you probably weren't there, <laughs> at least as a teenager, because most of us who were fully engaged in the 60s as teenagers, we were really lost, and I was one of those, just lost as a ball in high weeds, uh, you know, living in the northeastern part of the U.S. in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. And uh, without belaboring the whole story, uh, what happened to me was I believed in God. I believed in God because I'm, I, I have a reasonable amount of education and, and uh, an intellectual capacity. I don't believe in atheists. Amen. I don't. You... you there's no such thing, really. People who embrace this, oh, I'm an atheist, they're, they're seriously, there's a word for them in the Bible. Idiotes. <laughs> yeah, it is a Bible word. They, they saw the disciples, and the, their, uh, their understanding of the disciples, what these guys were, agramatos idiotes. They were unlearned goofballs. I think it's goofy. Honestly, I think it's goofy. There, I just told you about the complexity of, of the heavens, the complexity of the world under the sea, the complexity of life, the balance of nature, uh, everything about it. If you could just take a look inside of you and the complexities, the birth process, everything about it screams out that this is not an accident. Amen. There's nothing in all of creation that ever says, oops. It doesn't. Everything speaks out of design and wisdom and authority and power and, and amazingness. And so, you know, I, I, if you really believe that, that all of this came about by accident, you should be in your backyard today throwing auto parts into the air <laughs> in the sure and certain knowledge that a Mercedes-Benz will drop out. <laughs> it's just not an accident. But my understanding and my real opinion was that God had wound up the universe and walked away. That's how I felt. That's how it looked in my world. We were the first generation in the 60s to see not sanitized versions of war and newsreel grainy footages, but we saw it while it happened on 24-7 news. When someone got their head blown off, we watched it on the news, and it was a shock to a generation. The, the mistrust of leadership and all the things that happened. The, the 60s were, by every historian's perspective, a crazy decade. It was a crazy time. And, and I just couldn't see a God of wisdom and power and might involved in that. I just didn't see it. And so that was my phrase. That was, in fact, I had told a friend that just a couple of weeks before my first encounter with believing people. It was on a Tuesday night, as Pastor said. It was in the Dairy Queen parking lot in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, uh, on the Carlisle Pike. And uh, it was about 10 o'clock at night. I was there selling drugs. Long-haired, freaky kid, uh, you know, hair down the middle of your back, living large. Woo! He's doing what we did in the 60s. And I had a massive case of the munchies. Some of you know what that is, much to your shame. But the good news is that Pentecostals also get the munchies. Most often after prayer gatherings, it's like, what do you want to do? Go to Dairy Queen. Amen. Yes, and so they, they did, and there they were. And uh, my first time that I ever met with Christian people at all, ever encountered a person who was a Christian, I'd never met one. 
Never been in a church, almost 21 years of age. But I met these Jesus people for the very first time on a Tuesday evening. And I would have escaped from them except they made it impossible to escape. They would grab your hand and pump your hand and smile at you and sort of hug on you. And, and, and then they trapped my friend Rich by the Volkswagen. Story's too long to tell, but the brief version of it is Rich had the keys in his pocket. And so while he was trapped, we weren't going anywhere. And I walked around the side of the Volkswagen, and I leaned over it with my little hot fudge Sunday in hand and my eyes on these people, just thinking to myself, this is at least going to be comically entertaining. And imagine this. The first thing I heard this brother say, I'm looking over my friend Rich's shoulder, and there's a little Asian guy standing there. He's about five foot three, dark hair, typical Asian-looking guy, and he has his finger kind of wagging in my friend's face. And he says something like this. You may think that God wound up the universe and walked away. <laughs> Snap. Yes. I just, I, that's exactly what I did. I went, huh. <laughs> well, your aim is bad. <laughs> but, but I'm here. <laughs> and, and I stood there, and for the next half hour, I let the ice cream sundae melt all over my hand. Well, I heard him talk about a God who wasn't disengaged, but alive and well and working in the earth. And that he was mighty and powerful beyond measure and that he loved people. And that he was birthing sons and daughters to himself and that he'd take just about anybody. He didn't need the, the few, the proud, the marines, the smartest, the coolest, the best, the, the richest, the most powerful. He didn't need any of that because he had everything. But he was looking. For people who would just die to themselves and trust him. And I, from the beginning, I just thought, oh, I'm in. I mean, seriously, if you're looking in the loser lane, I'm here. <laughs> really, if you don't need the winners, I'm in. Really, if you don't need to me, me to be anything but dying, I'm good for that. I had no idea what that would cost. How many of you know it's still a one-step program, even if you've been saved for 40 years? The simple step to the will of God in your life is die to your own stuff. I, I say simple because it's easily understood, not because it's easily accomplished. So that was that first night, and I, I remember just, just being swept away by the emotion of the moment. Literally, in fact, in the emotion of the moment, I, I, I shouldn't tell you the whole story, but at this, at this one point, they finished up a little prayer they were praying, and, uh, and I was staring at them, just staring, because they were dancing about, while the prayer was going on, they were just dancing around in little circles and saying, you know, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and speaking in foreign languages. It was really, I, I had no idea. But I'm standing there watching them thinking, sure. Not really. The only people who ever get offended about public displays of Pentecostal, real Pentecostalism, are church people. Embarrassed church people. Hide their light under a bushel. Church people. I wasn't unimpressed at all. In fact, I was standing there thinking, I have no idea what this prayer means and what all is going on, but they clearly do, and whatever it is, awesome. I mean, yeah, I'm feeling it. And I'm standing there going, yeah. And then I realized they've stopped dancing because the prayer is over. And I'm staring at them, and they're staring back at me. <laughs> Come on, have you ever been caught being the starer? <laughs> you're supposed to cough. <coughs> you're supposed to act like you're not doing this. But I, I was too high to do that. So I'm just staring, standing there going, and about that time, one of them breaks into this huge grin, and she runs around the car, and she grabs my hand, the other one, not the one with the ice cream all over it. She grabs my hand, she starts pumping it, saying, isn't this exciting? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, it is, because it was. And then she said, are you a believer? And I said, yes. <laughs> I had no clue what a believer was. I didn't, but, I, but in the moment, it just felt right <laughs> to say yes. And, and that started the avalanche. They came over, they're hugging on me, and they're rubbing my hair. And uh, it, was just, it, was, it was amazing and frightening and enlightening all at once. 
And I remember going home that night, right away. I mean, I dropped off the buddies, stopped the work for the night, went home. And I remember in the darkness of my room just saying, you know what, I, I, clearly I, I do believe you're doing this. And I believe that these are your kids. And apparently, I really want to be one of them. I mean, I really, I really want to be one of them. Well, that, that started the journey that has since then taken me literally uh, to Bible college and trainings and whatever degrees and levels of, you know, understanding and training you need to have. But experientially, it's taken me around the world a bunch of different times. And, uh, and I've seen God, uh, without belaboring the point, just do amazing things. Uh, we, we saw God heal the sick on the streets when we were first saved. We were, the, we were the Jesus people who would stand out in front of various stores and just ask people, how you doing today? And if they said, well, I'm not well, we'd say, well, this is your good day then. Because we believe God heals the sick. We're Jesus kids. And Jesus heals the sick. And we would touch people on the streets. And they would, I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times. They would just jump back and go, what did you just do to me? I said, what do you mean? Well, and they, would, they would mumble about the feeling. And I would say, that would be God, not me. That's who he is. Amen. Come on. I, I believe this God hasn't changed. And I've seen it all over the world. I've seen God uh, just do amazing and powerful and wonderful things. And I'll tell you more about that tonight because I think there's a purpose for that. I think there's a reason that God does this. The first word that I've been talking about is privilege. I think in every way, on every day that we live, it is a privilege to walk with God. I, I, can't, I, I, I just can't imagine the people who yawn their way through a conversation about Jesus. I, 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 just, just, I don't even have a clue on how to relate to that because there's nothing yawnable about Jesus. There's nothing. He's amazing beyond measure. He's powerful. He's mighty. He's ferocious. How many of you know God is ferocious? Can I, can I be honest with you? Some of the thing that I think has messed up the church in the Western world is that the way the gospel's been preached, it's, it's been put out there as like a sales slick thing of, you know, just add Jesus to your life, and he wants you to be happy and well, and he wants you to die. Here's the reality. The wage of your sin and mine is death. And it's not by some evil, wicked someone somewhere. That wage has been set by the holy, ferocious, just, and perfect God of heaven. You are in divine crosshairs because you are under the sentence of death for your sin. And when God saves you by his mercy, he saves you from himself. you got to get this. He saves you from the weight of his wrath for your sins. Because he is not just only just, he's also the justifier of those who put their trust in him. That's why he did what he did. That's what makes what he did so amazing. He should be wiping us out wholesale. And yet with mercy, he is coming to wash us and to cleanse us and to remove us from our sins and our wickedness. To take us out of the darkness and put us into the light. This is the privilege of believers. Come on, you should give God praise for that. Amen. This is the privilege. But I see, I think, I think he has a purpose in our lives. I think there's something he wants to do with us. See, he saves us. He gives us this gift. This is, this is the truth of it. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Right? What did I tell you? The wage of sin is what? Death. It is. But the gift of God is not happiness, joy, peace, a cool church, help in all your troubles, a happy, wonderful life. <laughs> Some of you look so disappointed. <laughs> it's like, I, I want all of that. Eternally, you will have it. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. 
It's, it's not just this here and now. It's the eternal aspect. The here and now compared to the eternal is a drop in the bucket. It's the eternal aspect of it. It's the eternal glory of it. It's the, I, I don't know about you, but when I first heard about eternal life from some of the churchy people that I had met after meeting my Jesus people and getting swept into the privilege of being God's child, I met church people, and, and they talked about heaven. And, and they made it sound like we would all have wings and be on clouds and sing songs for like 10,000 years. And, and, and they seem to be excited about that. My question was, are any men going? <laughs> really? And then I read the Bible. And when you read the Bible, that's not how the Bible talks about it at all. The Bible, how do you know? I mean, do you know how the Bible ends? The Bible ends sort of in the, in the early part of the eternal with a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. The space city. I'm sorry. I, I, that may be too hard for some of you to grasp. But let me say it biblically. Coming down from the heavens. Throbbing with its own light and power. It settles down. Upon the earth. It's so big that the shadow of it goes from Minneapolis to Boston to Florida to Dallas, Texas. That's just the shadow. And we are the inhabitants of that new Jerusalem. So new heaven, new earth, new earthlings, this heavenly, this heavenly city, this awesome space thing that we're living in forever and ever. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that beats a harp in a cloud. Amen. I mean, I love good worship. You worship beautifully here, but that, that just beats singing for 10,000 years. That's adventure, that's excitement, that's understanding, that's learning, that's growing. That's a wild and crazy, amazing, animated deal. And that's just like the scratch of the surface of the beginning of our eternal life with Christ Jesus the Lord. Yes. Here's what I know. Wherever he is, I'm going to be. Yes. <laughs> Amen. And whatever he's doing, I'm going to be going, did you see that? Did, can you believe that? Amazing. But in fact, that's what I'm doing right now. Amen. That's what I think is our purpose right here. I don't believe that the purpose of your life and mine here is that we have to somehow live for God as though he weren't alive for himself. Yeah, you might need to work that one through by the tape. Think that one through. No, no, I got to live for God. I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do the other, and got to quit this, got to start that. Nah, nah, nah. All this I stuff. The reality is you just have to die to the I. You got to die to all that I stuff. So that what? So that the life of Christ Amen. might be manifest Amen. in your mortal flesh. So that you, through the Spirit, might be able to put the deed, to, to death the deeds and the works of this flesh. And that you might live a part of your eternal life out right here, right now. Woo! Now there's a purpose. But then I, then I take that a step further and I look at it and I say, okay, so my purpose here is to glorify God. What is it in the earth that I can do that glorifies God that I cannot do once we're past the judgments? Once death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Once the second death is passed. What are the things that I can do right here, right now that I cannot do then and forever? I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with all the nations. I can preach the healing, saving, cleansing virtues of the Lord Jesus Christ himself in a dark and fallen and sin infested world. I can do what he said to do, which is go, and in your going, make learners out of every ethnos that you encounter, every national grouping, every ethnic uh, grouping that you find. You don't have to just run around to find them. In your going, you'll intersect with them. And when you intersect with them, do this. Show them that you're a learner 
that you're a disciple. Be about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Tell them all the things you've learned about Jesus. Yak and chat until they're sick and tired and they start asking you, don't you ever talk about anything but Jesus? I know some of you think that's so unsophisticated. Yeah, but it's cool. And it's powerful. And it's productive. And if I miss anything in this life by living that way, I promise you, on the day of days, when we all stand before the Lord, I will not be embarrassed. Amen. 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 And that's what I want to encourage you to do. That's what I want to encourage you to. The purpose of the, of the, the church is like the purpose of Christ. It is the purpose of Christ. It's to provide a body for Christ. It is to provide this living place. He could do what he wants to do any way he wants to do it. But the way he wants to do it is through folks like us. He wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to fill your mind and, and transform it by the word of truth and his life. He wants to, to move through you with healing and grace and blessing and deliverance to the nations. He does. He wants you to be a reconciling force. Instead of just carrying a sign and protesting bad, he wants you to be a powerful spiritual force for good. By the Spirit of the Lord, moving in and through your life. And so this is the reality. I I love the story of Jesus' life and ministry because this is pretty much as good as it gets to me. He's still alive and well. He's still operating in the earth. And he's just looking for people who will say yes. I said it a long time ago, and I'm still saying it every day. And I want to encourage you to say the same thing. So here's the purpose then. The purpose is the purpose of Christ. You remember the story in John chapter 4? I'll just quickly kind of tell you a little bit of it. And then we'll look at how it lives out in the church for the next few minutes. But in John chapter 4, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, I, I, the, the Father's leading me. There's a guidance going on in my life that's going to take us through Samaria today. You remember the story? And he goes through Samaria, and the disciples, of course, they've learned by this time not to have a lot of big questions and, you know, committee meetings or votes about what the Lord says. It's a quiet place when I talk about votes. Anyway, they went, and uh, they went away to get lunch. It's the middle of the day. Jesus is sitting by the well while the disciples go off to get lunch. And remember the woman that comes out? You know the whole story. It's, it's really a neat story how it unfolds. And however you want to see her, she's choosing a, a sort of an off time, not the popular time. And f- perhaps for reasons, you know, that, that may be associated with her behaviors in the city. But the bottom line is that she is, a, she is in the eyes of most of the Jews and certainly the 12 disciples and probably the 50 or 60 other, you know, hangers on that are a part of this crew. She's just a, a dog. She's an outcast. She's a woman. She's a Samaritan. You know, she's a, she's a, a multi-time loser. And, uh, and so she comes to this well, and she, there's a Jewish rabbi guy. There's this, this guy. What am I going to do? You know, come back later? Uh, I guess I, if I can sneak by the guy, that's better than the wrath of the girls. So, so she's going to do that. And as she goes to sneak by him, Jesus engages her. Remember the story? He engages her in a conversation, basically asks her to get him a drink, and she's, she's, she knows the rules, and she says, you just broke all the rules. You know, and he said, well, you think that breaks the rules? Let me tell you about the drink. Because if you knew who I was, you could have magic water. Now, he didn't say it quite that way, but some, cause some of you are looking at me, like, no, 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 magic, no, no. He said, you can have water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. Sweetie, that's magic water. And she's like, okay, I'm in. Now, how are you going to get it? Because you don't even have a bucket. And he says, no, no, no. You got to get it. I'm the source of it. This is the revelation that starts to come to her, that I'm the source. And she's like, okay, well, now, nah, nah, nah. and she starts to go on. Remember what he said? He said, okay, before we get too much into this conversation, you ought to probably go get your husband. And bring him out. You know, the authority in your life. Go bring him out. Now, why was that? Why didn't he tell her to be born again? That's what he told Nicodemus. Why didn't he tell her to sell everything she had? That's what he told the rich young ruler. See, this pathway to Jesus is really through your pain. It's through your agonies. It's through your ego. It's through your stuff. Here's a woman who believed somehow that she had to belong to somebody, to be somebody. I have to belong to somebody. 
And she had been abused and misused so many times that she was even now distrusting her own system. And so she sort of hangs her heads and shuffles her feet. And I, I can see this. I've seen it in thousands of people. I just, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, ding, 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 sweetie, you're 0 for 5. You are. Yeah, and I'm telling you, you're believing a lie. That idea that you somehow have to have a man to make you a whole person. That's not the reality. That's not it. That's, you see, this is the reality. When God comes to you, he's, it's not just some generic little formulaic thing. He's going to meet you at the point where your ego is getting in the way of your death. And where your ego is getting, and if you you say, oh, that's too complicated for me. Sweetie, trail the path of your pain. Trail the path of your pain. You have an angry uh, issue with God. You have a thing where you're going, I I got a thing or or two to say to God about this. There's where he wants to meet you. That's exactly the place where he wants to meet you. Because it's right there that he intends to do something miraculous and powerful in you. And save you from yourself and your sins. Amen. Amen. She runs off into the town with this newfound revelation of who he is. And she's going to tell everybody, I love this girl. She runs into the town. The disciples come back and they see her there and he's talking. And then she whoom, runs away. And, uh, and which wouldn't surprise them. She would have run from them. But they come to Jesus, and they start to offer him the food. And Jesus says, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm really, I don't need it. Remember the line? And they're going, what, who's, where did he sneak food in from? Do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember? He said, I have meat to eat that you don't have a clue about. And they looked at each other and said, he's right, we're clueless. So, by the way, if you ever feel clueless, you're in the club. You're in the club. You're the kind that God is looking to use. Read Corinthians. He's not looking for the sharpest tools in the shed. Those who can bring their wealth of information and money and knowledge to the cause of Christ. Ooh. Like he needs that. You ought to be a little quiet on that one. But there, you know, who brought him meat? And then he said, my meat is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Here's what Jesus said. Get this. I am not operating on my own. The son, this is John 5 now, where he says the son can do nothing of himself. Only what he sees the father do. Because what the father does, the son then has the power to be able to do. Why? Because it's not the son doing it. It is him just pointing out this is what the father's doing. This is what life in Christ looks like. This is our purpose, to live and move and have our being in Christ, to be standing there saying, did you see that? Do you feel that? Do you hear this? This is not the word of the crazy preacher. It's the word of his majesty himself. This is the living word of God, and he does these things. Amen. Amen. This is what Jesus said. This is, this is what life looks like and that's that's really what I think is the purpose of the church I think that's that's who we're supposed to be I get a chance to go around the planet and basically do this here's what I believe the mission I said the mission service and I'm a missionary let me tell you what I think the mission of the church is it is not to bring the world to Christ it is to bring Christ to the world and more specific to the worldly To all of those who are caught in their sins and their darkness, we come along and we have light. And we say stuff like Jesus said. You don't have to run over there. You don't have to climb up there. You don't have to descend down to there. If you've met me, you've met the Father. We come in Jesus' name. You get it, huh? She's like, I want to do that. But that's scary. It is. It is scary. She probably won't be sitting in the front row tonight or now because of that. I didn't mean to do that to you. But honestly, th- yes, I did. <laughs> I really did. And I want you to come this evening. But I, I believe that this is the purpose. I believe that if we'll just move with him, he will, he will show himself as the Savior of the world. 
This is what the early church had to learn. They had to kind of discover that. What time is it? I, gotta, I set my watch down here, and then I ignored it. Oh, it's about time to quit. I'm, I'll pick it up tonight. It's okay. Tonight I want to talk to you about Holy Spirit empowerment because here's what I believe. I believe when we are about glorifying Christ in the earth, when we are about not how cool we are, how smart we are, how wealthy we are, uh, how sharp we are, when we're all about Jesus and all about his will for the nations, which is not that they perish, but that they come to eternal life, not that they be lost, but that they be found, not that they be sick, but that they be healed, not that they be in bondage, but that they be delivered. This is who he is. This is what he wants to do. This is why Christ has come. This is the will of the Father yes. and the Son yes. and the Holy Spirit who is breathed into and moved into our lives. This is why Jesus said, if you're going to do ministry, you're going to do ministry like me. Take my yoke, my truth, my teaching, all that is me on you and learn me. That's it. It's not learn about him. It's learn him. Get to know me. Amen. And as we start to do that, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit who is in us begins to powerfully start to flow through us. Here's what he said to his disciples. He said, now this is, this is the mission. This is the thing. I want you in all the nations to take this truth of this gospel and preach it everywhere just like I've done for you. Now whatever you do, don't start yet. Don't run out of here and start yet. That's what he told them, Luke 24. He said, wait until you are clothed, until you are endued. Wait until the Holy Spirit's power comes crashing in upon you. Not just a birth from the Spirit of God, not just the assurance of his loving mercies and his kindness, but the anointing of the Spirit of God, the epi experience, the upon experience, this poured out experience of God where he in mighty authority and power comes and baptizes you with the Holy Spirit because there you will find an anointing and empowering a partnership on steroids. Amen. It's there that you will find the ability to stand and say, listen, if you're looking to me, you're all in big trouble. You are. But if you look to Jesus, I promise you, hold on to your hat, Harriet. It is exciting and amazing beyond measure, and that's who God is. That's what he wants to do. His privilege that he brings to us is that he wants to live and move and have his being in and through us. Awesome. The purpose is for him to live and move his being through us. <laughs> Amen. To walk in the middle of the darkness in the light. To walk in the middle of the confused as a person of peace. To, to live in the middle of the world that's, that's just chaotic. Crazy chaotic. Oh, what's going to happen? People are afraid every which direction you turn. They're afraid to send their kids to school. They're afraid of, of what foolish thing could happen in the North Korean governmental systems or the U.S. or any other place. They're afraid of so many things. They're nervous. They're worried. They're all of these kind of things. And a lot of that stuff influences people who are supposed to be God's people. God's plan. God's purpose. Is to deliver you out of that junk. Amen. Amen. Honestly, to raise you up to a whole new level of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus where you begin to move and live and have your being in him and you are not troubled by those things. Jesus lived in the middle of one of the most chaotic governmental systems on the earth in its day. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ was birthed into that. The church in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, read this. I had planned to talk to you about it a little bit this morning. The time's gotten away. But read this story. This Antioch church, these crazy people who just took Jesus at his word and said, you know, this isn't a Jew thing. This is an everybody thing. We're going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. We're going to just get out there and start sharing Jesus with everybody. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 11, God so liked that that the hand of the Lord was powerfully with them. And they, they had renewal and revival so much so that they sent Barnabas up there. And Barnabas, when he got up there, he said, i got to find Saul. So he went and found Paul, and he brought him over 
to, to help to do this ministry out of the city. And from there, missions is birthed. Here's what they say about the Antioch church. By the way, the city of Antioch, just to tell you, the city of Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire at the time. It was probably five to 600,000 people in the day when the church was birthed there. It was a wicked city beyond measure. The groves of Daphne were just outside of the city. And, and in fact, one of, the, one of the, the slang phrases of the day is that the swill and the filth from the Orontes River reaches all the way to Rome. The Orontes was the river on which the city of Antioch sat. It was wicked. It was vile. It was dark. It was filthy. It was multinational. It was multilanguage. Amen. There were people from every nation who were a part and partner in that city. And God birthed the church there that became the powerful missionary force of the new covenant church of Jesus Christ. They say that in the first couple hundred years of its development, while the city of Antioch grew to somewhere between seven and 800,000 people, the church at Antioch numbered 200,000 people. That's a missional church. That's a multi-church, multi-language, multicultural, multi-congregational, multinational. Amen. That's what I call a 21st century church. Amen. That's what I think it wants to be. But they were a mighty church. Mighty through God till the pulling down of all the strongholds. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you'll help us. I pray for an excitement to begin to build in the hearts and the spirits of each one. I believe that yours is a word of eternal life. I believe that yours is a word of creative power. I believe that yours is a word of delivering power. And none of us can, can stand today and claim that in and of ourselves, we are anything or certainly not everything that we're supposed to be. But if we will turn our eyes up on you, just like Pastor mentioned, if we will see you for who you are, we will find the things that are a part of our life just begin to fall away. And we can die to them so that the life of Christ might begin to be manifest in us. So I pray, God, that the people who are people of privilege will begin to know and esteem and embrace that privilege. And then pursue after your purpose in our lives with all of their hearts. To them, I believe, you want to give tremendous supernatural understanding and power. I believe you want their days to be greater in the future than they have ever been in their history. I believe that the youngest and the oldest among us you will speak to about a powerful future in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to that